Okay, so this is Catherine Lamprecht. Uh, this is the Cullet, well, Chicago Foodways Roundtable, and it's also Highland Park Historical Society. And I believe there's also some people who came via uh, the, the Swedish American Museum in Chicago, because I saw we were on the, your uh, distribution list, which is just A-OK. -okay. We're thrilled to have you. So tonight's program, uh, came to us vis-a-vis -vis the culinary history enthusiasts of Wisconsin because they posted this on their Facebook page back in August. And he did a program on September 1st of which I could only spend 15 minutes because I had another Zoom event to go to, who knew? Um, but it was very interesting and I immediately said, we need to have you. Um, so Marcus Sederstrom, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, is a folklorist, which we don't normally encounter. We've had anthropologists, we've had historians, but not too many fo folklorists. So you're, it's great. So he earned, Marcus Sederstrom earned his BA from the University of Oregon in sports, business, history, and Scandinavian studies. That's interesting all by itself. And his MA and PhD in Scandinavian studies from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he works for the Department of German, Nordic and Slavic studies as the community curator of the Nordic American folklore for the sustaining Scandinavian folk arts in the upper Midwest project. So wherever you are, you're welcome to join us. Um, Great, Marcus. thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that's a it's, a, it's a mouthful all those all those things, uh, but yeah, you nailed it. Um, also, uh, the first, the very first job I had in Sweden when I moved there after college was actually at the Sports History Museum in Stockholm. So I was able to put a bunch of my, my, my three majors from Oregon to use almost immediately, uh, which was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so I, I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'm a folklorist there uh, and do a bunch of work with uh, immigration, with folk art, with um, indigenous communities, actually. Uh, but today, we're going to be talking a little bit about Swedish pancakes and a bunch of other foods. Um, but first, I always like to kind of start with like, what, what, what is folklore? So, so folklore is tradition. Uh, whether it's art or jokes or songs or stories or whatever it might be uh, that's passed down from one generation to another or circulated between one person and another. So usually this happens orally, um, not always, but, but usually it's orally. Uh, so think about all the things you learned from your parents uh, that you've now taught your children or your friends or your neighbors. That's a form of folklore. So folklorists spend their time asking a ton of questions. We ask questions about communities. Who makes up a community? Uh, what does that community do that makes it unique and special? Uh, what kinds of traditions do these communities have? How do they pass those traditions on? For a lot of Scandinavian communities, trolls, like the ones pictured here, uh, are a big part of their traditions. Um, some of you may even have your own troll stories about, uh, from, from the US. Uh, I heard one not too long ago about a troll here in Stoughton, Wisconsin, uh, who, this was probably about 40 years ago when, uh, when a guy was talking to, he was a little bit younger, his grandpa was used to warn him about the troll over by the well. Um, so we can see that maybe those troll stories also played a uh, part in keeping people safe, especially little kids. We also though, when we're talking about what folklorist does, we ask questions about individuals, not just communities. We ask questions about objects, about art, and about food. Um, so you can think about a, a Norwegian immigrant chest, or rose mauling, or lefse, uh, and then think about the th people you know who make those things, who create these things. Uh, we sometimes refer to these people as tradition bearers. Um, they're people who have a specific traditional knowledge that's important to who they are, um, and probably important to who you are. So sometimes you can find that information in books. Um, here in Wisconsin, there's a great one called Wisconsin My Home uh, by Thoreen Olison, uh, which is a fantastic example of finding folklore written down. A lot of times though, 
individuals have that knowledge and uh, slowly but surely pass that information on. So that can, of course, take the form of stories. Uh, I still remember some of the nursery rhymes that my um, dad recited to us uh, in Swedish when I was younger. Uh, but I also remember how to celebrate a Swedish Christmas. Uh, for us, it was ham and meatballs and mashed potatoes and green peas on Christmas Eve. Uh, it meant Santa was going to come knocking on the door in the middle of the afternoon or early evening uh, and ask if there were any good children around. We would then lie and say that there were, and we would get uh, presents passed out to us. And the poor, the poor dog, Daisy May, was scared to death. Um, but these, these aren't stories that I was told. These are traditions that have been passed on to me that I grew up actively taking part in. Uh, and we all have these traditions. We all have folklore that shapes our lives. So because of that, folklorists go out in a lot of different communities to talk with a lot of different people. Doing so helps us make just a little more sense of the world, um, whether it's how a community comes together uh, or how people identify themselves or how immigration shapes our lives for generations or for the sake of today's discussion, what food can tell us about our communities. So what do I actually do? I document these things. I document these stories and pictures and jokes and holidays and family histories because they're an important part of folklore, because they're a history that individuals have control over. Uh, it's a history that doesn't always make it into the books you read at school, but that is incredibly important to individuals, to families and to communities. These are the documents of everyday lives that people have experienced. Um, these documents help all of us see how people create and recreate their traditions because traditions and cultures, they change. They have to change to stay relevant for the next generation. And if you walk out of here with nothing else, just folklore is tr change, tradition is change. They're constantly changing. Uh, and sometimes they're changing in really drastic and obvious ways. Um, an example of that would be uh, what's known as Eula booking. Uh, this is where people would dress up as, a, as, as goats uh, around Christmas time and go uh, door to door, um, knocking on those doors, singing songs, asking for food and drink. Uh, this doesn't happen too often. This was happening quite a bit, he, even here in, in the upper Midwest. Um, it came over from Norway and Sweden. Uh, it doesn't happen all that often anymore. People getting dressed up as goats and knocking on your door in the middle of the winter uh, is not something that you see too often. Um, this is one of those traditions that's changed pretty drastically in that it doesn't really uh, exist anymore to the same uh, extent that it once did. Um, others change much more subtly thinking about recipes and how we maybe use a different ingredient or add a little twist because we don't like a certain taste in our, uh, in our cookies. Um, and we'll see some of that kind of change today as we talk about food. But first, I'm gonna make you all work. Um, so I'd like for you all, just we'll take like, I don't know, this is the teacher and me, we'll do like a minute-ish. Uh, you've got the chat available to you there. If you just type in, what are some of the words you associate with Nordic and Scandinavian foods? So just take a minute and, and type those in. We've already got someone coming in here. Yeah, there we go. Dill, lutefisk, ebelskiver, cardamom, more lutefisk, meatballs and fish. Lefsa, cardamom, seal. The sea buns, herring, salmon. Ooh, comfort food, cool. Pancakes, berries, whale, sardines, glug. Potato lefse, beer, open-faced sandwiches, bread, lingonberries. Oh, you guys are so quick. Akavi, cinnamon rolls, salted cod. Ikea dining room, yes. Uh, boil, boil it till you like it. <laughs> That's fantastic. I was gonna try to keep up and, and, and type those here and there's just no way I'm gonna be able to do that. So. Uh, Swedish meatballs, dark bread, yes, fantastic. Hot dishes, egg yolk cookies, smuggesbord. Get off, relax. Oh, we've got some fantastic examples here. 
Red jello, okay. Tre kroner. Goat cheese. Yes, so many fantastic ones. Um, so then, how many of you have eaten these things? Have you eaten a bunch of these things? And you can just throw, you know, put your hand up or, or say, yes, I've eaten whatever it might be in, in the chat. A lot of yeses. So then my question is, have you made them yourself? Most of these, are you betcha, many of them, some of them. How about someone in your family? What we see here, Swedish pancakes, what we see here is how these foods matter to us, right? Just like really quickly, this this amazing list of things and how they're a part of our everyday or our traditions. And those aren't necessarily the same thing, they oftentimes are, um, but there's a fantastic array of foods that just came out uh, in, in, the, uh, in the chat here. And that's because food matters. It's one way we situate ourselves during the year. Think about what you eat at Easter or on the 4th of July or in Wisconsin at a Badgers game. Food helps us situate ourselves with our families, our workplaces, our churches, our communities. What we eat can tell a person where we come from and who we grew up with. Not always, of course, but the foods that we cook and eat and bring to people, they, it matters. So in 2007, uh, here's, here's the folklorist, the kind of the academic in me. In 2007, the Journal of American Folklore published Michael Owen Jones' 2005 presidential address to the American Folklore Society. And Jones is a well-known folklorist who's written a lot, like a lot, a lot about folklore and food. Um, and in this address, he begins First, and I'm quoting here, first, not only particular, particular foodstuffs, but also the procuring, preparing, and consuming of provisions figure largely in symbolic discourse regarding identity, values, and attitudes. Second, people have multiple identities, ethnic, regional, gendered, classed, which have dominated inquiry, but also many others that rarely have been examined. And these identities are dynamic, subject to challenge and change through the life course. Third, eating practices reproduce as well as construct identity. In addition, both identity and elementary symbolism, not just taste or availability or cost, significantly affect food choice. Okay, that was a, that was a lot. But what Jones is saying there is that the making of food is important to who we are. The eating of food is important to who we are. The process of making one particular dish may have several different steps. The steps of the recipe, of course, um, depending on the cookbook, it sounds like you might be working with a cookbook here, here coming up that's maybe uh, less uh, step, stepful. Um, but, but the steps leading up to getting the ingredients to make the recipe also matter. All of these things go into the making of a dish. Uh, and that process often includes a whole host of traditional knowledge that is informally taught and passed down and it is often changing. That's folklore. So there are plenty of Nordic foods, some of which you named uh, that a lot of you are probably familiar with. Uh, there's there's um, sustrømming, there's crayfish, there's uh, kallis caviar, there's reindeer, there's blue put blood pudding, there's uh, open face sandwiches, which someone someone mentioned. Uh, uh, there's this stuff, uh, sandwich cake. I'm not a huge fan of sandwich cakes. Um, and there's memi, which is this molasses -y dessert made of water, rye flour, powdered malted rye, seasoned salt, and dried powdered Seville 
orange zest. Uh, it's kind of, it, or not kind of, it's quite finished. Salt licorice. And so many baked goods that I'm not even going to pretend to name them. But we're talking about Nordic American food and drink today. And the first thing that I want to get across is that Nordic American food is its own thing. We'll see that a bit as we go along here, but it's an important thing to remember uh, because like I mentioned earlier, tradition is change. So the foods that I listed that were Nordic, some of them have made their way over here to the United States and some haven't. And some have changed a bit in how we eat them or when we eat them or even why we eat them. Uh, and one thing that didn't pop up, a lot of times when I ask people to describe or kind of this word association with Nordic foods, they give me colors like gray or brown. Uh, so I appreciate that you all went kind of straight for, for what's really uh, the, the different types of foods. Um, as Dr. Long points out in, in the chat here, there is so much great folklore research uh, on food and, and she edited this food and folklore reader that is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic resource that you should 100% check out from your local library or buy. So I'm actually gonna start with a drink, not a food when we talk here about Nordic American food, uh, coffee. And I need to admit something. I don't drink coffee. Uh, I can't stand the taste. Uh, me and caffeine, we don't really get along. Uh, and I have heard every single joke imaginable about someone with a Swedish passport and a PhD in Scandinavian studies not drinking coffee. The fact that I've heard these jokes that my unwillingness to drink coffee has become a point of discussion is exactly what we're talking about today. Food matters, drinks matter. Uh, it matters to how we see ourselves, but also to how others see us. A Swedish American who doesn't drink coffee. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. But here I am. And people want to point that out. Because coffee is incredibly important to how Swedish Americans formed and performed their identities. There are a lot of ways to do this, including the coffee pot water towers uh, that we've got one pictured here. Um, Coffee-themed festivals. There was Kaffe Fest in Wilmer, Minnesota. Uh, Coffee-themed parties throughout Swedish America. So right off the bat, we see how a food is presented and consumed, but presented. It's a way to mark to someone, to say to someone, hey, I'm Swedish or Danish or Finnish or Norwegian or whatever it might be. And these, these uh, dapper looking gentlemen here uh, were a part of the Wilmer Saucer Drinking Society, uh, which existed from the late 1920s up until about World War II. Um, and a group of Wilmerites then opened a new chapter in Minneapolis in the 1930s uh, and then did a reenactment in the 1970s where society members drank coffee from a saucer, right? It's the Saucer Drinking Society. Um, and here we see people consuming the coffee, of course, but doing so as a part of a group and later as part of a performance. Again, we see how this food, this drink in this case, brings people together. And then there are variations of coffee. There's egg coffee. Has anyone had egg coffee? I see a couple heads nodding and a couple yeses there and a couple raised hands. So this recipe, I have not, again, I'm not a big coffee drinker. So I have not had egg coffee. Um, but this recipe calls for egg to be added and beaten as you boil the water and coffee. So I'm wondering for those of you who have had egg coffee, does anyone have a different recipe? Not really. There are a lot of different variations of this tradition. Um, some include the shells, others don't. Uh, but all of them are supposed to make the coffee a little less bitter. 
So here's where it gets kind of interesting. Remember we talked about how you bring things over during migration and how things maybe change in the new world. Um, if you go to Sweden and ask about egg coffee, you'll get a lot of confused looks. Uh, that's because traditions are changing. Swedish America is not Sweden and Sweden is not Swedish America. And plenty of traditions in one place have changed so much as to no longer be recognizable in the other. Egg coffee doesn't really exist in Sweden, but you can find it a decent amount here in Swedish America. Um, and that's because we're constantly adapting how we live our lives. Uh, and if you put an ocean between us in a hundred years, things are gonna change. So there's a few, a few questions there in, in the chat. Does egg coffee taste different? Uh, it's supposed to. It's supposed to, again, make it a little bit less bitter, a little smoother. Um, and you strain out the, co uh, uh, strain out the coffee. Uh, you strain out the egg uh, to, uh, in, in most recipes here. So when we do this, Right when we keep eating, drinking egg coffee, for example, we're holding on to certain things that help us show who we are. They help us identify ourselves. Uh, and plenty of people like coffee, of course. But when we start coupling our love for coffee with our Scandinavian heritage, we're doing more than just enjoying our coffee. We're saying we belong to something bigger. We belong to a community. We're claiming our identity. I am Swedish and I am Swedish because I eat Swedish pancakes and drink Swedish egg coffee. All right, now we're on to Ludafisk. Every single day brings us closer to Ludafisk season. So lut uh, means lie, L-Y-E and fisk means fish. So we have lie fish, literally. Uh, and I always joke that the people who say they like it are lying. Uh, so we started off here, I've started off here with two Nordic American foods that I'm not a really a big fan of. Um, but lunafisk is a really important one uh, in the Midwest and in, in the upper Midwest. Uh, this picture's not as great as I'd hoped. That's okay. Uh, you, get the, you get the sense of the white gelatinous uh, fish that is lutefisk. And people eat this a lot. Uh, come November, December especially, you cannot go very far in the upper Midwest uh, without finding a church, cultural center, a school, a fraternal organization that is offering a lutefisk dinner. Um, this past holiday season, obviously in the midst of the pandemic, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge people found creative solutions. The American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis, for example, hosted a drive-through Ludafisk dinner uh, and it sold out like fast. Uh, and people came by in their cars, they, did, uh, they picked up their Ludafisk dinner and headed home to enjoy, um, to enjoy this tradition. So there's always this question then, like why are, why are we still eating a fish that is today soaked in caustic soda, which is known as lye, as opposed to birchwood ash as it, as it used to be. Um, surely it's not just the taste, right? Uh, it's something that has become a ritual, a tradition. It's almost sacred, not necessarily in a religious way, but sacred in a familial way in which we associate lutefisk with the holidays or with friends or with family or with traditions or with our heritage, our Swedishness, our Norwegianness. Part of the appeal might be that it's kind of weird, it's kind of different, it's kind of special. Um, and these things lead to a lot of humorous jokes and even songs. So we're gonna give this a shot here and play. This is an old, old, old recording. Uh, so it's not the greatest quality, but we're gonna play a, a chunk of this song here, O Ludafisk, because to be perfectly honest, I think it's kind of entertaining. Uh, and it's a, it's a reminder again of how food can take many different forms um, and bring us together in, in, in community. If this is a problem, uh, if you can't hear, you should be able to hear, but it's, you never know. 
uh, let me know in the in the chat and we'll see what we can do to figure it out. So there it is, O oh, Ludafisk. And there are a ton of uh, different songs about Ludafisk. There are a ton of jokes about Ludafisk. You can find cartoons uh, from newspapers from 100 years ago about Ludafisk. It's, it's a lot of fun to, to joke about um, because it becomes part of this community. It helps us be a part of a community. So today, Ludafisk is probably more common in the US than it is in the Nordic countries. Um, there's, a, there's a fun little article uh, from Smithsonian Magazine a few years ago now um, that quotes a bunch of Norwegian food scholars who looked at this and uh, found that the United States out eats the Nordic countries per capita um, when, it comes to, when it comes to Ludafisk. Uh, so, so again, here we see how a tradition has changed in, in the, the Nordic countries, for example. Um, what was once quite common there is much less so today. Uh, instead, it's quite common in the Nordic diaspora. So Ludafisk becomes this way to signal, again, who we are and where we came from. Uh, and luckily, in my opinion, we, we only need to do this once a year, uh, although I joke about this because I, I do find it really entertaining, but it's such an important part. And, you know, this last year has been a tough one um, for a lot of reasons, uh, especially when it comes to the holidays. So I really appreciate these creative solutions like the American Swedish Institute has done with these, these take-home <laughs> drive-through Ludafis dinners. Um, because not being able to meet in the church basement uh, is hard. Uh, for a lot of people. And so it's important to remember that food can bring us together. And when we lose that, when we lose that ability, um, we lose a part of that community. Uh, so I'm hopeful as we move toward the summer and um, this pandemic gets a little bit more under control, we can take advantage of these things. So when you see that Ludafisk dinner, even if you're like me and maybe not a huge fan of the Ludafisk, um, Try to go, try to check out your local church basement and, and um, support, support these traditions. Now though, to the title of the talk, kind of, pancakes. Uh, and we're also gonna be talking about pea soup, uh, which might seem like a strange combination, uh, but it's delicious. We're gonna start with pancakes. Uh, pancakes in Sweden were considered really quite fancy back in the 1800s. You needed a pan and it's called a cake. Uh, there were eggs involved. Uh, this was nothing you just kind of threw together for a breakfast to start your day. Um, it was mostly eaten as a dessert. Uh, and in fact, in Sweden still today, pancakes are for dessert, uh, which makes sense really. I mean, fancy sweet things often are desserts. 
here in the US, that tradition differs a little bit. Um, and I, lo I love this article so much, so much, uh, because it spells out exactly what is happening in that very first paragraph. Swedes in Sweden don't have pancakes for breakfast, but Swedes in America do. So to have a Swedish breakfast for Swedish Americans, we find that the best and safest bet is to take the best of both worlds. This is the best of both worlds. Uh, back to that, that church basement, you might find yourself in a church basement eating Swedish pancakes with maple syrup, which would be an uncommon uh, topping in Sweden, next to a spoonful of lingonberries, which is a more common topping in Sweden, next to some bacon, which is a less common side for pancakes in Sweden. And this sounds delicious to me, uh, and I'm glad that most of you said you'd already eaten dinner. Um, and it is very, very Swedish American. And what we see happening here are the traditions that we carry with us melding with traditions in our new home. We're taking something that we recognize in both cultures, pancakes exist in Sweden and pancakes exist in the United States, uh, and making them fit the context of our new community. That is to say, as that article explained, because in the US pancakes are eaten for breakfast and because in Sweden pancakes exist in a slightly different form, they're much thinner as we see here, um, and are eaten at a different time, we're changing the tradition that is eating pancakes. It makes sense that we would begin eating them in the morning here in the US. We're taking an immigrant tradition and placing it in an American context. Uh, we do this with all sorts of things as we figure out ways to kind of maintain our cultural traditions and cultural heritage, while at the same time, changing them slightly to fit our new everyday experiences. Remember at the beginning, I said tradition is change, right? This is when this is coming. We see these traditions and they're changing to stay relevant. Um, so yeah, in Sweden, you're probably not gonna find too many people who eat pancakes for breakfast, but you'll find some who eat them for dinner and plenty who eat them for lunch, especially on Thursdays, uh, which I think someone mentioned here in the chat. Um, So Thursdays at lunchtime is a very, very specific time and day to eat pancakes. Uh, but this happens throughout Sweden. You can't walk too far on a Thursday without seeing a restaurant advertising Doggen's lunch, the lunch of the day, just pea soup and pancakes. So usually there's a bit of ham in the pea soup and usually there's a dollop of coarse grain mustard to go with it. And we see that here in the image, the, the mustard up at the top right. Uh, we see a little bit of ham in, in there. And we also see the left some knäckebröd with, with some butter and cheese. Uh, and that's followed then by our pancakes. So how did this happen? Why do Swedes and some Finns eat pea soup with pancakes on Thursday at lunch? Elaine asked, asked the question in the chat, like why, why Thursday? Uh, Depending on which source you read, uh, and there are lots of them, there are plenty online, there are plenty in print. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of potential reasons. There are a lot of potential reasons. Uh, it might be that when Sweden was Catholic and needed to get some meat in you before Friday, they decided let's get some of that ham into the pea soup. Maybe, but maybe not. Uh, maybe because toward the end of the week, the restaurants were trying to get rid of food stores uh, so you just take the kind of end of the ham, the leftover ham, uh, chop it up a little bit into small chunks, throw that in. Um, maybe it was the military, since in both Sweden and Finland, the military has long served this on Thursdays. Chances are, based on a very long history, uh, that the pea soup happening on Thursday is a Catholic remnant in Lutheran Sweden. Again, we don't really, we don't really know. Um, but based on a lot of uh, historical research, food historical research, this is probably the best bet. Okay. 
as Michael asked in the chat, where do the pancakes come in? Why are there pancakes on Thursday? Good question. Again, <laughs> I have no answers. Uh, we have a lot of theories, um, but no real answers. Some people say that pancakes became more and more common in the 1800s as the 1800s uh, moved along, um, but were still seen as kind of fancy. So adding them to a relatively simple and easy meal like pea soup made for a slightly fancier meal and a slightly fancier meal was slightly more expensive, which was good for the restaurants. Others say that pancakes, or at least the smaller relative of the pancake in Sweden that's uh, been eaten since about the 1500s, uh, had been eaten with pea soup and other soups in general. Um, kind of how you might eat, uh, I don't know, you add a baguette when you're, when you're eating your carrot and ginger soup, uh, which is something we do in, in my house uh, relatively regularly. This is the thing about folklore though. A lot of times we don't necessarily know the origins. And a lot of times the origins aren't the most interesting or important part of what we're thinking about when we start talking about this thing. What is of interest is especially how the tradition continues and why the tradition continues, where the tradition continues. And this constant question of like, why does this matter? So I wonder how many of you, again, we'll just do this in the chat. How many of you have eaten pea soup with pancakes here in the United States? Is there anyone? A couple head nods, a couple yeses, but not a ton. How about just Swedish pancakes? How many of you eaten just Swedish pancakes? Some hand raises, some head nods, a lot of yeses coming here. Always, yes, absolutely. So then my next question, and some of you beat me to it, how many of you ate them for breakfast? See a couple there, Swedish American Museums, Breakfast with Tomten. Lot of yeses, lot of yeses. How about for dessert? Whether that's dessert at lunch or dessert at dinner. A couple of yeses, but a lot of noes. So we see here these changes Right? We see how we've taken these traditions that are very Swedish and changed them a little bit in our new context. And this happens over generations. So why does any of this matter? Right? I mean, this is, this is the question I always tell my students to ask. And so it's a little dangerous to tell students to ask you, so what? Uh, but it's an important question. So what? Why does this matter? And it matters because over a hundred years ago, Swedes and other Scandinavians began coming to this country. They brought with them their holidays and their clothes and their language and their foods. And oftentimes it took them several, several generations to learn English. Um, so they lived in their communities. They lived with their families. They lived with their Swedish immigrants. They lived with their, uh, this, this idea of kind of, um, what is, what is known as chain migration, where they would send for their brother or their sister or the neighbor down the road. Um, and they would set up these communities in very, what became very Swedish um, kind of hubs or Norwegian hubs. Today though, these Swedish Americans, these Scandinavian Americans, they and we, we still drink our coffee, eat our lutefisk, and now we have Swedish pancakes for breakfast because Swedish tra because traditions change, right? In Sweden and in Swedish America, in Scandinavia in, and in Scandinavian America, which is how we end up with these Swedish pancakes for breakfast. Um, but also because traditions can make something sacred, as something as simple as, as coffee or lutefisk. 
um, or pancakes. They're thin, they're delicious, they're Swedish. Uh, and when that happens, we stick with it uh, as long as it stays relevant or we change it to make it relevant. Um, for food, that relevance comes from our ties to family and friends, uh, our history and our heritage. Um, in time, the food we will eat is probably gonna change. Uh, and that's okay, food matters, but it's the life we live that includes the food that gives it and us a lot of this meaning. And so we see here, this is a, from a couple of years ago, my family uh, with a, a sort of makeshift um, Swedish, uh, Swedish Christmas dinner up in, up in the mountains in, in Colorado. Um, and it's, it's the Swedish Christmas that I learned growing up, right? There were peas on that table and there was ham and there were boiled potatoes. Uh, and there was, uh, there was Akavit, uh, which I don't know that you can see in that picture, which is probably fun. Um, but it's an important part of who we are. And these traditions, like the Swedish pancakes, they change a little bit over time, um, but they still help us, help ground us in, in community. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. I see there's a few already in the chat, so I will get to those. I love this picture, by the way. This is, this is a pretty long stocking, um, <laughs> trying, to make, trying to make pancakes. This is what it looks like when I try to make pancakes. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and we'll move to a little, to my, my talking head, I guess. And there we have it. So there's a few questions. Uh, let, me, let me try to get to some of these. And there's some comments here that are also, I think, really great. So, so Elaine wrote, um, my husband says his grandma used to speak Norwinglish. And this is, this is fantastic, right? We can talk so much about the, uh, the, the language aspect of immigration and Scandinavians coming. Um, there's Swinglish, there's Finglish, uh, um, a lot of different variants. Um, Bill here writes, we couldn't find Swedish pancakes in any restaurant. We're told yellow pea soup and Swedish pancakes were for children. Oh, I 100% disagree. Um, I ate, <laughs> when I was working there a few years ago, uh, my buddies and I at the, I, I worked for a diaper company, uh, sold ecological diapers. Um, anyway, uh, just about every Thursday, we would, we would head out uh, and grab our pea soup and pancakes. Uh, for lunch and come back very full and really quite tired. Um, Anna Christine, my parents came in the 20s, so we ate the food that was popular then and still do. And this is, I think, a really important aspect too. A lot of times uh, when we talk about immigration, we get stuck on this kind of idea of the generations. So the first generation uh, uh, retains things, the second generation rejects these traditions and the third revives them. Um, it's not the best way of looking at tradition. Uh, it's, it's a lot better to think about when did people come over? What was going on in, in, in the world, in the country? Uh, and how have those traditions then been cemented? Uh, what about fika? Fika. So fika is um, ubiquitous <laughs> in, in Sweden. Uh, it is, it's basically coffee and coffee and cakes time, uh, usually right around 10 o'clock uh, in the morning and then again at two or three in the afternoon. Uh, and offices will literally shut down to make this happen at work. Uh, universities will literally shut down to make this happen uh, on campus. Um, so fika is actually a, uh, the, the word itself comes from this kind of weird slang for coffee uh, that was popular, um, this, this type of slang that was popular back in, in the early 1900s, I believe it was. Um, it's become uh, really an institution. We see it here now in the United States. There are little cafes and restaurants named fika um, throughout the country. Uh, it's an important part of the Swedish food tradition. Um, some comments about crepes. Yeah, uh, crepes are dessert. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so why do I pronounce it lutefisk? Lutefisk is very much the upper Midwestern way of saying this. So lutefisk is uh, also the spelling that way is the Norwegian spelling in Swedish. It's lutefisk, um, L-U-T-F-I-S-K. Uh, 
I don't know. I've been in the upper Midwest for a while now, so this is this is what you get. Um, oh, here's a good question that I do not have an answer for. Why is cardamom so popular throughout Scandinavia? I have no idea, but I love cardamom buns. Uh, I think I prefer them to to the classic Swedish cinnamon cinnamon bun. Are there many nation specific foods in Scandinavia kind of loosely defined? For example, something common in Sweden, but rarely seen in Finland. Flyg on the Jakob is a 100% excellent example of this uh, from Peter here. Um, Flyg on the Jakob uh, is a very, very much a creation of the 1970s. Uh, it is, let me see if I can get this right off the top of my head. It is uh, cream. It is chicken, it is uh, bananas. Uh, I don't know, what else is in a fig in the Yoko? Chili sauce, uh, super weird, super weird. It's also surprisingly delicious. It was invented by a man named Yoko uh, who entered a competition um, for kind of, uh, for, for a food magazine in, in Sweden for foods that were uh, kind of easy to cook and, and good for kids. Um, if I remember correctly, he worked at an airport. Uh, and so we get the flieg on the Jakob, the flying Jacob. Um, but yeah, there are these foods that are, that are, that are specific to the different nations in Sweden, uh, in Sweden and Scandinavia. Um, you get uh, the fermented shark in Iceland, for example. Um, you get that kind of molassesy. Uh, dessert-like food that I mentioned from, from Finland. Um, memmi is what it's called. Uh, and then you get these variants. And I think this is an important thing to remember also. Uh, we've got a graduate um, student here at the University of Wisconsin, Madison Mirva Johnson, who's doing just fantastic work. She's a folklorist and a linguist. Um, she does a lot of work with Finnish Americans up in Ulu, Wisconsin and just posted a, uh, a really wonderful short little video um, that she put together and a, a blog post about uh, a woman's cardamom bread, which in Finnish is known as pola. Um, and in uh, this, this woman, Gloria Johnson, has, has Swedish heritage, but lives in Ulu, which is a very, very, very Finnish American um, area. And so, so Gloria makes what she calls kind of cardamom bread or pulla with a Swedish twist. Um, and it's a really fun, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna drop this in the, uh, I'm gonna drop this link in the chat and you all can check that out. Cause I think um, Mirva's work is wonderful and it deserves to be recognized as such. Um, so so the, that was a long, winding answer to the question that yes, there are a ton of these different types of things and there are, there are plenty of, of variants as well. Um, American food time capsules. Yeah, host of a new Scandinavian cooking was, was in the US. He kept hearing about potato sausage when he returned. It was an old recipe from a period of food deprivation. It's not been eaten in Scandinavia for years. We get a lot of these things, right? Um, these things that kind of uh, remind us of where we came from, who we are. Um, and uh, it's, it's a way, again, of kind of showing that, that heritage and identity. Um, Scandinavia now bo boasts some world famous restaurants. Is that having an impact on ethnic Scandinavian food in the United States? Um, that's a fantastic question. And to be honest, I haven't yet seen that happening. Uh, I would not be surprised if, it, if we do start seeing it happen, um, but it hasn't quite taken root. Um, I'm excited to see that happen because I think it will, because I think a lot of this like new Nordic, right, is, is kind of a back to the, back to the land uh, movement. It started with a, a Danish, um, a, a, mo a group of mostly Danish chefs uh, who wrote a manifesto. Uh, the Danes enjoy writing manifestos for some reason. They did it with film as well. Um, but New Nordic is all about kind of going hyper, hyper local. 
uh, and thinking about how you can use this food um, uh, that, that you'll, that's, that's right in your backyard, essentially. Um, and so I would not be surprised at all to see that kind of taking hold in different ways here in, in Nordic America, um, but I haven't seen it yet. What's the difference between Swedish pancakes and what we call crepes? Uh, that has to do, I'm gonna probably mess this up, but I believe it's a different type of flour um, that gets used for, for crepes or crepes um, than, than we use with Swedish, um, Swedish pancakes. Does the role of food in Scandinavian community in the Scandinavian community distinguish itself from the role of food in other communities? Uh, this is always one of those like annoying answers, but yes and no, uh, right? The, the, way, the way that food um, is important in different communities will differ based on that community. Uh, but I don't know that there's anything particularly special about the, the Scandinavian relationship to food. Um, that, that we wouldn't see in, in other communities. Again, when, when we think about the, the importance of food uh, and food ways, uh, we can look at how it brings um, families together. We can look at how it's eaten at certain times of year. We can look at um, the, the place. Uh, we can think about the recipes. We can think about the jokes that emerge from it. Uh, all of these things happen in, in a variety of, of communities. Um, you mentioned in, in the chat here, the Jewish community. I mean, just a wealth of wonderful traditions, uh, food traditions in, in the Jewish community. Um, some fantastic ones in, in the Italian American community. I mean, you can just go down the list, right? Uh, food is a really wonderful way to think through and about immigration. Um, it's a really wonderful way to think through and about the history of the United States and, and what that means. Uh, what about uh, Janssen's Temptations, Janssen's Festelse? Uh, this is another one that is often eaten at, um, at Christmas. It's a, it's a quite Swedish example uh, to go back to this question. Are there kind of nation specific ones? Fermented shark is awful tasting. Uh, I mean, it's, so it's the same thing here, right? When we, when we think about some of these foods, when we think about lutefisk uh, and, and we're, how we're producing food and creating food and why we're eating it. And it's, uh, it becomes a really important part of, of a person's identity and of a person's community. Um, I was in Iceland a few years ago uh, with my with my brothers, um, and my brother has a has a buddy who lives there. Um, and one of the things that we just had to try that he just wanted to have us taste was this fermented shark because it was it's this kind of rite of passage, uh, but also an important part of of who they are as as Icelanders. Is Iceland considered a Scandinavian country? Uh... <laughs> It depends on where you are. Um, generally speaking, Iceland would be considered a Nordic country. Scandinavia is often in 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 Europe. Scandinavia is generally defined as Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, uh, and the Nordic countries then are Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, um, and so we get this kind of extra uh, layer there. Some discussion about reindeer, which is delicious. Whale uh, in some countries is still served. There's obviously a lot of uh, environmental issues when it comes to that. Um, Iceland, uh, for example, still has a whale hunt. Um, they, I believe, only hunt the minke whale is sometimes referred to as the stinky minky because it's uh, got a very distinct odor when it's out in the wild. Um, it is not, if I'm remembering my, my whale knowledge correctly, it is not an endangered or even threatened species, um, but there's a lot obviously that goes on with, with that. Uh, what else we got here? Knocking for candy on Christmas Eve. Uh, 
that sounds super interesting and not something I've necessarily heard of. I wonder if that is related to this kind of tradition of EULA booking um, where, yeah, the kids, when the kids would do it, they would try to get candy and, and bake goods and adults would try to get uh, drinks that were maybe a little bit stronger uh, all the while playing, playing some music and singing. Some great, yeah, I mean, there's just some, some great, uh, great examples here about patalti's cold of potato, uh, potato sausage. Um, uh, Noma, has Noma had a positive impact on Danish cuisine? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question and, and that brings a lot of interesting So Noma, Noma is a uh, super fancy restaurant, uh, one of the uh, best restaurants in the world pretty regularly. Um, it's in Copenhagen, uh, very much follows this kind of new Nordic um, cuisine thing. Uh, it's also incredibly expensive and incredibly uh, exclusive. Um, and so it brings up these really interesting and tough discussions about what uh, we talk about when we talk about kind of Nordic cuisine and this new Nordic cuisine that's supposed to be like getting back to the land, uh, making do with, with the foods that you have, making delicious foods with, with, the, with what you have. Um, how does that work when it's so exclusive that only the uh, very rich have access to it? What does that mean? Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, I think, I think Noma uh, and, and the new Nordic uh, cuisine movement probably has a pretty, has had a really pretty positive effect, definitely worldwide on Scandinavian cuisine. A lot of people are not thinking about Scandinavian cuisine just as like gray potatoes, uh, which, is, which is a good thing because it's so much more than that. Um, but it does, it, it's a tricky question for sure. Um, there's the Ikea, absolutely. Uh, Ikea in, in Schomburg for Swedish food. Uh, oh, the tradition of the princess cake. I have to be perfectly honest. I don't actually know the history of the princess cake, princess torta, which is really terrible because it is one of my favorite baked goods uh, in the entire world. Um, it's this beautiful uh, domed cake that's just filled with cream and marzipan. Uh, and um, it's got this, this beautiful uh, green um, color on the outside, often with a little pink rose on top. Uh, I think they tried to make it in, in the Great British Baking Show uh, a while back. Uh, Bruna Bernard, are they Swedish or Swedish American? They are both uh, for sure. Um, I have to be honest, this is one of those things that I came across more in Swedish America. I was talking to my dad about it uh, because we never had Bruna Bernard growing up, um, brown beans growing up uh, for Christmas. And he was shocked that I didn't know what it was. And I think a little embarrassed um, because it was something that he very much grew up with uh, every single Christmas. So this is uh, definitely uh, a both Swedish and Swedish American. Early on, somebody asked, how do you define a Swedish pancake? Oh, how do you define a Swedish pancake? Uh, so Swedish pancakes are, as you saw in a lot of those pictures, right? These really kind of um, thin, uh, light, uh, relatively big, in terms of kind of circumference, I guess, if I remember my, my trigonometry or whatever <laughs> correctly. Um, they're, they're super, super fluffy uh, in that kind of like very thin way. You get this um, modeling almost uh, with, uh, with the butter. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's probably how I would describe them, right? How I would define them. Uh, they're uh, a lot of egg, a lot of butter. Um, yeah, that's probably that's probably how I would define them. Uh, they're really beautiful. They're, at least for me, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, very difficult to make. Very, very difficult to make. Um, 
and uh, then you do have you do have these smaller ones. Remember, I, I spoke uh, when we were talking about the kind of the, why are we eating pancakes on Thursdays? Um, that there are pancakes from way back when in the 1500s. Um, these are known often as platar. They're they're smaller uh, and a little bit thicker. Um, that are usually made. Actually, I see. There we go. Yeah, uh, Anna Christine here has has written that. Um, uh, small ones made in a special special pan uh, are these platar. So there are kind of differences also when we talk about Swedish pancakes. There are different types of pancakes that are made in Sweden. Um, so also also something important. Um, yeah, and, and Dr. Long here speaks to this really. Noma seems to have had a huge impact on the perception of Scandinavian food, that it's a refined cuisine and not just traditional dishes made by grandmothers. That's a really important thing when we talk about Scandinavian food, right? Like I said earlier, usually when I ask people, like, what do you think about when you think about Nordic food? Like, uh, it's white, it's gray, it's, you know, gravy and potatoes and cod, um, all of which are delicious, uh, by the way, um, but not often thought of as refined or fancy or, or whatever it might be. And Noma and the new Nordic cuisine has really taken that to a different level um, and gotten people thinking about like, what does it mean to, to be eating Nordic food, Scandinavian food? Um, I, so someone's asking here about the Escalade Festival. I am not familiar with that festival, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm gonna, so I, so I cannot uh, uh, speak about that, I'm afraid. Um, I think, yeah, not sure, I'm sorry. We've got something here, Malor, yep. Malort. I actually don't know how to pronounce that, which is a little embarrassing, but it's very much a Chicago invention um, that, that plays, its, plays up its kind of Scandinavian roots, but very much a Chicago invention. I think I, I, think I got most of the questions. There was someone that asked earlier about Garrison Keillor and, and folklore. Um, Garrison Keillor is a super interesting character when it comes to kind of Nordic American folklore. Uh, because he's an institution, right? Uh, for, for better or worse, um, he's an institution. And he, I would say uh, when it comes to kind of the role of Garrison Keillor in folklore, he's, he's done uh, something that's really kind of impressive in playing with and on and about uh, the various traditions that are so common and stereotypes that are so common in Nordic America, um, many of which are, are very much true, right? Uh, but but he plays with them into this kind of fictional um, world that is that is uh, really kind of uh, impressive in the way it draws people in and and brings again and creates again community. Um, out of out of these traditions, for sure. Good Swedish pancakes look like spotted cows on the plate. That is a fantastic. I, I might I might steal that from Matthew. That's a wonderful way of describing um, that kind of modeling uh, that, that you see on them, which is so beautiful. I think we've had one person who has had her hand up since almost the beginning, and I don't know if it's a mistake or not, but Christian Jacobson. Oh yes. Kristen, is that were you, were you raising your hand to to uh, point out that you had uh, eaten the food, or did you have a question? Oh well, I think maybe just to point out that she had eaten one of the foods. <laughs> there we go. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, and then so, so someone asked about Malor. Uh, Malor again. I'm sorry. I don't, I, Lack of Chicago pronunciation of this word. Uh, Anise-based uh, liquor, high in alcohol, very bitter. Um, you get a lot of these kind of uh, snops akari that have um, that, that are kind of anise-based uh, and anise-flavored. 
um, it's uh, it's a pretty common uh, kind of flavoring for for a lot of the liquors um, that are often then consumed at, at certain times of the year. Um, Midsummer, Christmas, our, our crayfish parties are all good times to, to have a little aquavit for sure. Do you mind, a few years ago, we actually had a program on lutefisk. Oh, cool. And I made the lutefisk. If you don't mind, I'm gonna share, share yes. the screen. And this was, I bought the, 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 the dry cod I soaked it for a number of days to get the salt out. Then I put it in a high pH solution and, you know, changed that several times. Then I had to do the rinsing all over again a number of times. And the thing that was kind of like, oh, uh, the thing that put you on edge was that you don't really know until you cook it, did you do it right? And if you did it, you didn't rinse out the, uh, the, uh, the, that uh, high pH solution adequately, or you did it too long, your fish would be like soap. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Gives you lots of confidence in what you're doing. <laughs> and so uh, I prepared this for, I, 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 what you see here is what was prepared for the culinary historians meeting or Chicago Foodways Roundtable. And we did this in December and I baked this in the oven. I, I think, yeah, because that's parchment paper, and I think some liquid for about 20 minutes, which was longer than I thought it should be cooked, but far shorter than any lutefisk recipe. And we had a gentleman, uh, Mr. Rose, come up and he goes, well, it tastes, you know, he says the texture's fine, but it doesn't have that taste. And I says, well, wait a moment. And I took a chunk and I put it in a microwave and blasted it. And it was now like rubber. And he chewed it. He goes, oh, this is exactly the taste I like. Now, flash forward, I didn't take the garbage with me when I left that day. The next morning, I had an email. This was uh, hosted at Kendall College that the students had come to clean up later in the day. And the stench was so bad from that lutefisk that they were throwing up into the garbage can. But anyway, all lutefisk... Um, whatever. Anyway, I thought it was terrific and I've never made it since, but I was rather proud of it. That's fantastic. I mean, and, and again, so we see, we see these stories pop up around food, right? Both, both the delicious and, and maybe the, the, the rubbery or the stinky or, or whatever it might be. But I think it, it also speaks to that, that quote early on, um, from, uh, from Michael Owen Jones about kind of the process and the procurement being such an important part of food and food ways. Uh, so, so these sorts of things like lutefisk, they take a long time. It is a process. Uh, it was also a way to ensure that you had food in the middle of the winter. Um, some places in Scandinavia, uh, especially, you know, several generations ago, uh, it's not always easy. Uh, the winters are rough and they are long and they are dark and they are cold. Um, so you would dry cod and then you would reconstitute it this way, you know, months later, uh, and then you would enjoy your, your lutefisk dinner. Um, but it is very much um, a process. And we're seeing some some jokes in there about in the, in the chat about lutefisk. I, th I think this is a really wonderful example of the folklore that pops up around food as well, um, because these jokes we tell, these stories we tell, uh, these memories we have, they all help make us who we are and help us connect to our community and to our family and to our friends, um, which is a really fun thing about food, whether they're weird or or not. I shouldn't say weird. Uh, it sounds more judgmental than I mean, but but it's an important part of who we are. Well, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate all the good comments and the good questions. And, uh, and he's a new papa. He's got a son that's three months old. I do. Uh, I do. We're surviving. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> Mostly surviving. <laughs> and not too much sleep, right? 
<laughs> not too much sleep. Not enough. Not as much as I'd like, but we're getting there. Well, thank you again. And we hope to see you another time. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye, everyone.